We just had our Manitoba Wildlife Federation annual general meeting recently in Brandon and had an incredible guy came and gave a phenomenal talk. Dr. Scott Forbes from the University of Winnipeg told the room about, about this incredible lake out here, Lake Winnipeg, and what's, what's going on with the lake. And, and really, his presentation took the AGM by storm. He told us that the lake had issues and potentially was at risk. And so this lake now, because of these fish, these incredible emerald-backed, green-backed, gorgeous walleyes, has become very popular. It's an incredibly important commercial fishery. And Scott had a lot to say about what, what he thinks that we should be doing to make sure that this lake stays strong forever. And so we were able to capture his presentation and we have it here for you now. And hopefully you, you'll enjoy his presentation. If you care about Lake Winnipeg, you need to watch this right now and, and listen to what Scott has to say. So we have these for future generations forever. There are two major issues um, uh, facing the Lake Winnipeg fishery. I'm going to talk about uh, the Lake Winnipeg walleye fishery. And the first uh, is the arrival of zebra mussels. Um, no one, and if they, if they do claim to know what's going to happen, they're wrong. No one knows what the impact on the fishery is going to be. Uh, it's probably going to be bad, but we don't know what the impact of zebra mussels is going to be. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Um, you also know that Lake Winnipeg faces severe challenges um, concerning eutrophication. Uh, so too much phosphorus in the lake and all the algal blooms. And that problem's probably going to get worse before it gets better. And again, no one knows how that's going to impact uh, the pickerel fishery in Lake uh, Winnipeg. So um, with those out of the way, uh, I'll turn uh, to the future um, of the sport fishery. And that hinges on the future of the commercial fishery. Uh, and uh, the Lake Winnipeg uh, commercial pickerel fishery is the mainstay of the province. It is the principal revenue generator. Uh, it is the, the elephant in the room. And uh, it is undergoing um, uh, 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 severe change right now. Now, the Lake Winnipeg uh, commercial fishery is uh, managed in a perverse manner. Uh, and it is a historical legacy of decisions taken about a half century ago. Uh, the Lake Winnipeg commercial fishery has something that no biologist would ever condone as the basic management strategy, and I'm going to talk more about this in a little bit, uh, and that is the multi-species quota system which exists. You're probably familiar with it, but if not, it is uh, the simple fact that fishers on the lake the commercial fishers have a quota, and it doesn't matter what species it is. It includes whitefish, it includes sauger, and it includes walleye. Uh, so we have this pooled quota, uh, and the fishers can choose to catch whatever they want out of those three species. Usually they choose to catch the most valuable, and that right now are the pickerel. And the total quota uh, on the lake is about 6.5 million kilograms. Uh, and so we have this, this irrational foundation of management which exists. Uh, we also have um, within the system, uh, the fish are marketed to a single desk Crown Federal Corporation, the Freshwater Fish Marketing Corporation. Uh, they play an important role and not always a good one. So the history of commercial fishing on Lake Winnipeg is long and we have a data record going back to the 19th century. Uh, and what you see here is the walleye or pickerel catch um, uh, in, uh, well, what we've got at the top uh, in recent years is about four and a half million kilograms uh, of pickerel taken out of the lake. Uh, it wasn't always so. And uh, in the early decades of the 20th century, uh, the whitefish fishery was co-equal to the, the pickerel fishery. But in recent years, the value of pickerel has increased to the commercial fisher, and they now target that. It makes up about two-thirds uh, of the catch on the lake. Uh, I'll point out a couple of um, features just to, to, to belie the, the, the myth that the fishery has always been managed sustainably. Uh, the fishery collapsed in the 1960s due to overfishing, uh, and it took a very long time to recover. In recent years, uh, we've been riding the crest uh, of a massive year class of fish, the 2001 year class of fish. I would recommend uh, that you schedule time in the 2020s um, as the 25-year-old uh, fish from that year class. There might be a world record pickerel in Lake Winnipeg uh, in the early 2020s. Um, and the commercial fishery uh, rode that uh, single year class for about a decade, and uh, the, the catches soared. 
uh, they soared so much uh, that they're now unsustainable. Uh, and this is uh, a problem going forward. So uh, just a little bit of data. This is a, 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 re a table extracted from um, a report, uh, which I'll show you later. Um, and this uh, was uh, a 2011 report, which was uh, a task force review of the quota system in Lake Winnipeg. And so they have some very nice um, summary data. And on the, the two uh, columns you see uh, on the left and the upper um, table uh, is just the catch of whitefish, the other principal um, harvested species, uh, alongside walleye. And you'll notice that in the early years, uh, in the 1940s and 50s and, and 60s, uh, the catch of, of pickerel was much lower. Uh, and the, the catch of whitefish has remained relatively stable over the decades. But in recent decades, the catch of the pickerel has increased um, dramatically. And the image on the bottom right-hand corner shows why this change has occurred. And this is the relative value to the commercial fisher of pickerel versus whitefish. And in recent decades, um, walleye, pickerel, have become much more valuable. And so now, uh, from where they used to be, making up about a third of the catch uh, of the commercial fishery, they now make up two-thirds of the catch. Uh, and this uh, harvest of about 4.5 million kilograms a year is very likely beyond um, what is sustainable. So um, what we see uh, is, uh, again, uh, a, a table uh, or a figure extracted from the 2011 task force report. And uh, I won't go into the details, but the horizontal lines you see are what are different estimates of the sustainable harvest of pickerel from the lake. And you'll notice that in the 2000s, the catch is well above all of those lines. Uh, there are a variety of ways that fisheries biologists use uh, to estimate what a sustainable yield is. Uh, so a, a yield which can be sustained year after year after year. And we're well in excess of that right now. So the commercial fishery is now fishing at levels which cannot be sustained. Uh, and this, of course, depletes the fish stock for anglers. That's a major problem. Now, there are two key factors um, associated with the commercial fishery, and, and these might come under the category of ugly little facts. Uh, the first is um, the commercial fishery takes most of the pickerel in the lake. We don't know the exact figure. We know what the commercial harvest is. Uh, one of the major data gaps is we don't know what the, the angler harvest is. But uh, a reasonable back-of-the-envelope calculation would be the commercial fishery takes uh, north of three-quarters, maybe seven-eighths of the pickerel um, out of the lake. So um, the commercial fishery uh, takes most of the fish. <clears throat> um, okay, and I have to, to um, fess up here. Um, that's my son um, holding the pickerel. Um, that's not a Lake Winnipeg pickerel. That's from Lake Manitoba. Um, but let's just pretend for the moment. Um, <clears throat> The other ugly little fact that is inconvenient for the managers, inconvenient um, for the commercial fishery is that the economic value of the recreational fishery is three to four times that of the commercial fishery. And this is a problem that I've seen for decades. The same problem existed in British Columbia uh, when anglers went to war with the commercial fishery over the salmon industry. And uh, the recreational fishery always um, took second place because the commercial fishery was able to make the case that it's their livelihood, it's their jobs. Well, in fact, there's a lot more jobs associated with the recreational fishery uh, than there are uh, in the commercial fishery. Um, but... Uh, it doesn't have to be a competition f between the two. The lake has lots of fish. There's enough fish for both groups if it's well managed. The problem is it's not well managed. So um, <clears throat> anglers were up in arms last fall when the minister uh, made a seat-of-the-pants decision uh, to extend the commercial fishing season because the commercial fishers um, pleaded for it. And this is the style of management which went out of fashion in the 1950s, um, where a minister, just by ministerial fiat, uh, can change the game. And this um, is uh, bad management practice, and it has to change. And uh, there is a potential solution on the horizon which can um, result uh, in better management practices. Uh, the current state is that the fishery is managed for the commercial fishery uh, and the 
uh, the recreational anglers are something of an afterthought. And the commercial fishery is at a crossroads now uh, because the marketing landscape is changing dramatically uh, in ways that the uh, commercial fishers are not pleased about. Um, but uh, there is a revolution taking place in fish marketing, and it's a revolution which spans the globe. Uh, it is um, pervasive in North America, it's pervasive in Europe, uh, and it's extending to other markets overseas, and that is consumers are insisting that their fish are taken from sustainable and certified sustainable fisheries. Uh, and this is the process of eco-certification. And eco-certification is a game changer, both for the commercial and recreational fisheries, for reasons I want to explain right now. So uh, the management challenges on the lake um, right now are well known. Um, first, uh, the multi-species quota system is insane. Uh, and cannot be um, uh, sustained biologically. Uh, it makes a rational management structure impossible, so it has to go. Uh, the second is that we don't have the data uh, to be able to evaluate management models. So we need to know a lot more about what's coming out of the lake. We need to know a lot more about both the commercial and sport fisheries. Um, the third issue associated with the uh, commercial fishery is the serious issue of bycatch. So you've all heard of bushing. Um, so when people are out trying to catch um, pickerel and they catch something else, whitefish, um, freshwater drum or bass, uh, perch, uh, and they don't want to keep them, well, they're just tossed over the side or beached. Um, the process of bushing that all commercial fishers uh, deny exists, but all uh, know does exist. And then finally, there's a lack of effective mechanisms to manage the fishery. Uh, and that goes right back to point one. So there are these four major issues um, which confront the commercial fishery. And all of these impact the recreational fishers. So in the fall of 2015, uh, the commercial fishery was called out uh, by an eco-certification agency, a Californian agency, uh, Seafood Watch, uh, relying on an analysis done by the Suzuki Foundation in British Columbia. And this was intensely embarrassing to the province. Uh, the, uh, the criticism was that the Lake Manitoba, or the, the Lake Winnipeg fishery, uh, the Manitoba fisheries in general, uh, were the worst managed in the world, which is an exaggeration. That's not true. Uh, but they are badly managed. And to quote uh, the newspaper article, which appeared in the Globe and Mail, uh, but actually it was one of Bartley Kiva's uh, pieces which was picked up. Uh, Seafood Watch said Manitoba fisheries suffer from a poor understanding of stock sizes and catch rates, no catch limits for some species, lousy data, poorly regulated bycatch, no harvest control rules, and an unenforceable multi-species quota system that lumps in walleye, locally known as pickerel with sauger and whitefish. Um, basically, Seafood Watch uh, got it exactly right. And they didn't have to look very far because the Suzuki Foundation biologists simply went back to 2011 um, technical assessment of the status, health, and sustainable harvest levels of the Lake Winnipeg Fisheries Resource. So this was the task force set up in 2008 uh, by the then Minister um, uh, of Water Stewardship uh, to evaluate uh, what had to be done in order to um, fix uh, the issues concerning with uh, quotas uh, in the commercial fishery. And in fact, what they were really trying to do was increase the quotas. Uh, um, expert task force was assembled, including both stakeholders and scientists, and they concluded uh, that the Lake Winnipeg fishery was a mess. Uh, and it lacked the data, it lacked um, the management framework, it lacked uh, the quota system which could work, uh, and made no recommendation about the quota system saying, you have to fix a bunch of problems. So uh, the response to this 2011 task force um, report by the province was, um, and these are not the obvious steps I would have taken. First, the staff in the fisheries branch was not increased, but it was reduced, uh, mainly by not filling vacant positions. Uh, in the last year, they've eliminated the position of director of fisheries. So now the uh, fisheries branch no longer technically exists, and fisheries resources now have a lower priority, and they don't have a champion um, when it comes to uh, speaking to the cabinet ministers. 
Uh, and finally, the budget for the fisheries staff was reduced. There were times when the remaining staff, and I should point out that the staff in the 1980s numbered about 90. Now, the current staff could fit into a seven-passenger van and a compact car. And uh, there were times in the last four years when the current staff who were still left couldn't get out on the lakes to do the survey data uh, that they need to do, the test fishing, because they didn't have money for gas for the boats. So this is a major problem. We don't have staff. They don't have funding. This is why they're going to the Fisheries Enhancement Fund uh, to fund projects which normally, which uh, in the past, were just funded um, out of the ministerial budget. So um, the response of the province um, has been to um, slash funding to conservation and water stewardship. Uh, and so the problems, in fact, got worse after the 2011 task force report, not better. And in 2015, in the fall, when Seafood Watch embarrassed the province, uh, the response of the province was, wait for it. <clears throat> we'll uh, have another task force to review the commercial fishery. Um, since we just had one um, four years ago, uh, we ignored it. So uh, the solution to the problems are not found in the previous task force report, uh, such as giving uh, the biologists the resources to do the proper management, uh, but instead, let's set up another task force to do it all over again. There was good news associated with the announcement. The same week, um, the minister... Uh, and I should point out that the minister is well respected by his staff, and, and uh, that counts for me. Um, they actually uh, prefer him uh, to previous occupants of the chair. So in terms of uh, the minister, it, it's not his fault that all of this has happened. He's new to the job. Um, uh, he did announce, uh, and we need to know if this is going to be carried forward after the 19th of April, uh, is that they're committed to eco-certifying um, Lake Winnipeg. And if that is in fact the case, that is extraordinarily good news um, for everyone, especially anglers. And I'll explain why. So um, eco-certification, if you're not familiar with it, it is um, uh, where a third-party agency um, verifies that the industry practice is conducted in a sustainable manner. And the gold standard for this is the Marine Stewardship Council, or MSC. Uh, and you may know that recently um, we had our first eco-certified fishery in Manitoba on Waterhen Lake. Uh, and so we have some of the worst managed fisheries in the world, but the Waterhen Lake fishery is a consequence of the process of eco-certification is among the very best managed in the world. So we can do it here. Um, the Marine Stewardship Council was formed by a partnership between um, a giant foods corporation, Unilever, uh, and the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Uh, and it was a response to uh, the demands of consumers that we don't want um, to cause the extinction of the fish that we're eating, uh, and we want to know uh, that they are being harvested in a sustainable manner. And so it sets up an, uh, an incredibly rigorous standard. Um, the MSC rules are, uh, and from my professional point of view as a, as a, as a biologist, uh, it is um, the best uh, that I've ever seen. Uh, it was uh, concocted or put together after um, expert consultation with uh, more, more than 300 groups and individuals. Uh, and it is uh, in, um, a rigorous, difficult process to get through. And at the end of it, you know you've got a system that works and produces a sustainable harvest over the years. There are three basic principles uh, to the MSC standards. Uh, the first is that the um, fish stocks have to be harvested sustainably. So fisheries must operate in a way that allows fishing to continue indefinitely without overexploiting the resource. So we're not doing that on Lake Winnipeg right now. The second is that you also have to minimize the other environmental impacts. And so this includes things like bycatch. Uh, you can't decimate other species while you're trying to target uh, pickerel on the lake. Uh, and you have to take steps uh, to avoid the interception of other species. Uh, you have to minimize the impact on the ecosystem as a whole. This is a good thing. And then finally, you need effective management practices. So all fisheries have to meet all local, national, and international laws, and they have to have mechanisms of enforcement. And currently, we don't have that. Under the multi-species quota system, that doesn't exist. 
we do have an example to follow, and this is the Water Hen Lake fishery. So Water Hen Lake um, sits between Lake Winnipegosis and Lake Manitoba uh, and is fed uh, by the Water Hen River. Uh, and it is uh, a small northern pike and uh, pickerel fishery uh, and has about 20 fishers on the lake. Uh, and the process of eco-certification um, started some years ago. Uh, and this was led by uh, members of the fisheries branch of the provincial government. Uh, but myself and my students played a small role in this. Uh, so this is uh, pictures I took while we were on Waterhand Lake. I had two honor students, uh, Marianne Geisler and Tim Pellissier, uh, who did age and growth studies of pickerel and northern pike. Uh, you see uh, Marianne and Tim uh, uh, extracting fish out of some of the test nets. Uh, and there's some of the pickerel and northern pike and, and a few of the other species that were taken. And uh, so their data from their theses went into um, the eco-certification process. Uh, and that was important um, to this because you need to have good uh, understanding um, of age and growth uh, of the fish that you're harvesting. So um, the fishery was eco-certified. Uh, it passed muster after a rigorous review. Uh, and um, the question is, why should we bother eco-certifying? And uh, the reason is that if the commercial fishery wants to keep market access, they need to do this. And uh, this has been led by the European Union. But in North America, it's game-changing when Walmart says it won't sell anything except eco-certified fish or McDonald's or IKEA or Loblaws and Sobeys and Safeway, uh, these companies will no longer sell Manitoba fish except those harvested from Waterhen Lake, and that's a tiny fishery, by the way. Uh, and Manitoba commercial fisheries are losing market access. Uh, we've just lost Highliner Foods. Uh, they're now sourcing their uh, walleye uh, pickerel from Lake Erie, which has recently been eco-certified. So um, to maintain long-run access to the markets, uh, we need to eco-certify the fishery, but this faces uh, steep um, headwinds. Uh, and the main opposition comes from the commercial fishers themselves, uh, but also, uh, and this is um, particularly irksome, uh, the Freshwater Fish Marketing Corporation, though um, they pay lip service to eco-certification, has not been helpful. <clears throat> And I don't want to pick on Chris Isfield, who was quoted in a Free Press article, but um, I'll just um, quote what he said. Uh, the Lake Winnipeg fishery is one of the most successful sustainable fisheries in the world, um, which is factually untrue. Uh, and he called eco-certification a set of ethical regulations that improve sustainability for an aspect of the environment a load of crap. And that is a view held by many commercial fishers on the lake. And if you can't get the commercial fishers to buy in, it can't happen. It's as simple as that. Uh, and the main objections from the commercial fishers are that it is nominally expensive. It'll cost about a quarter million dollars to eco-certify uh, Lake Winnipeg. Uh, it has to be renewed every five years. That costs another $50,000. But if you start doing the math um, and you spread out the costs over the five-year period, it's about um, a penny or two a pound of fish. Uh, when they're getting north of $3 a pound, a penny or two is something that's affordable. Um, the big objection, however, is that the current system, the multi-species quota system, uh, is dead as a dodo under eco-certification. It can't stand. Uh, and this is uh, what really angers the commercial fishers. Uh, and um, the final uh, objection is that, well, we can still sell our fish. There are still markets for the fish, which is true today, but it won't be true tomorrow. So um, what I foresee, uh, and this is, um, this is actually good news on, on both pathways for the uh, sport fishery. There are two futures for the commercial fishery. Um, if the commercial fishers don't go along with the process of eco-certification, and that's going to be exceedingly difficult, um, herding cats is a much simpler task uh, than trying to get commercial fishers to agree on anything. So um, anyone who's proposing to eco-certify that lake faces a steep challenge. So without eco-certification, it's good for the sport fishery, for reasons I'll explain in a moment. With eco-certification, it's also good for the sport fishery. So let's look at the pessimistic view. Um, the pessimistic view is that over a series of years, the commercial fishery will die. 
uh, a slow death, a painful death, if they don't eco-certify. Uh, and my uh, forecast, my vision is that they will be um, ultimately sentenced to selling their picker load to the back of pickup trucks in bar parking lots. Uh, that's the future um, if you don't eco-certify the fishery. Uh, so if the commercial fishery dies, that leaves all the pickerel for the anglers. So that's good news for, for us. Um, but that's actually um, not necessary, and uh, it's, uh, it's pessimistic. As I said, there's lots of fish in that lake, and there's lots of room for both the commercial and sport fisheries. Um, with eco-certification, though, um, it's good news um, for everyone. Uh, the management of the Lake Winnipeg um, uh, commercial and recreational fishery now moves to a sound management scheme. It's based on good data, uh, and it is doable. Um, the multi-species quota system will have to go. There's just no question about that. The management system will be based on better data. Uh, in order to get better data, we need to have the people to collect the data, so it's going to require um, restaffing the fisheries branch. Um, management will be based on responsible management policy, um, and you have to be able to cut harvests if the stock declines. And so we won't have more seat-of-the-pants management procedures as we saw in uh, 2015. Um, and the important part from the perspective of this group here is that uh, for eco-certification to proceed, all stakeholder groups must be on board. So obviously the commercial fishers uh, have to be on board. The indigenous fishers, uh, and many of whom are commercial fishers, have to be on board. Uh, but the third um, stakeholder group are the anglers. They have to be on board uh, because they are a significant user of the pickerel resource. So... Um, that is good news because what it means for anglers is they're going to get a seat at the table. If we go through the process of eco-certification, anglers need to show up. Uh, so um, if you choose to do so, you get a seat at the table. And anglers, because of the economic muscle uh, that you can flex, uh, means uh, that you uh, get an important seat at the table. So... Um, and I'm not going to reveal the source of this information um, uh, to protect the individual, but these are good data. Uh, the sport fisheries were three to four times the commercial fishery. So it is only allocated now somewhere between one quarter and one eighth of the catch. Um, so those numbers probably have to change. And the way to make this happen is get organized, um, get prepared in advance of the eco certification process if it does go ahead. Uh, and that means learning about the process. Uh, and you can go to the MSC website. It's all right there. Uh, and you need to get strong representation out of this group. And you need to build solid data-based arguments um, on why uh, anglers um, should be considered and how they should be considered in this uh, long-term process. Uh, there are plenty of fish to go around. And with a well-managed fishery, everyone can thrive. Uh, there's no need uh, to be um, combating each other. But right now, the fishery is not well managed. We're not getting the most out of what we should be getting out of um, what could be a world-class uh, both sport and commercial fishery resource. And finally, um, uh, I would just like to see this fishery be sustained so my kids can enjoy uh, the pickerel fishery when they grow up. 